Yes. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, today we have Ornana Skay. She's a professor of radio astronomy at the uh, Jodo Bank Center in the University of Manchester. She's also funded by the UK's uh, Alan Turing Institute. And so her work is really at the interface of radio astronomy and uh, artificial intelligence. And today we're going to hear about uh, that specifically applied to the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, deep learning for radio astronomy. Um, and mainly I'm going to talk about uh, image-based deep learning. Um, if you want to ask questions about um, other types of data in deep learning, that's also fine. Um, so um, everything I'm going to talk about today is sort of building towards the SKA. I'm guessing for most people here know what the SKA is. Um, for those who perhaps don't, um, it is uh, two telescopes. So the Square Kilometer Array Observatory will operate two telescopes, a mid-frequency array in southern Africa um, and a low-frequency array in Western Australia. Um, and those of you who are familiar with radio front-end technology will recognize the difference here um, between the traditional dish-based antennas that work in centimeter wave, wavelengths and the dipole-based um, phased arrays that work at meter wavelengths. So this is very similar to the, um, the low-fold telescope or the MWA telescope um, or other telescopes of, the, of that sort of ilk that uh, work at longer wavelengths. Now, I'm not going to talk about telescopes, I'm not going to talk about science. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the data. So, obviously, you don't build a telescope like the SKA without it being motivated scientifically. So, the SKA is primarily a scientific facility, but it is also a big data machine. So, if you take the two telescopes, the output from the telescopes is about 10 terabits per second for each of them. Within the low frequency array, if we saved all of the raw data, it would be about five exabytes of data, sorry, five zettabytes of data per year, <coughs> um, which is a huge volume of data. We don't keep that data rate. It goes through two major stages of processing, obviously correlation to the interferometry. Um, beam forming is done at the site, and then image formation for images, and then further processing for time domain data and it gets compressed down to about 300 petabytes per year per telescope into the archive. So it's about 600 petabytes per year, um, which makes it one of the largest data volumes anywhere in the world, um, whether we're talking about academia or industry. Now, on the same time scale as the SKA, um, CERN RUN3 will be producing equivalent volumes of data. So this is not just a, sort of an explosion of data that's happening in astronomy, not using radio astronomy, but also in other scientific fields. And, and that's dri being driven, in my opinion, by um, improved digitization over the last sort of decade that's allowed us to do this, uh, to, do, to be more flexible with our data. Um, so just summarizing that, that the SKA will be the world's largest radio observatory, although there are others creeping in there now. Um, uh, it is designed to answer big scientific questions, but it is also a big data machine. And the quantity of data, the volume of data that we're getting, going to get as the SKA, and are already getting out of the precursor and pathfinder instruments for the SKA, such as ASCAP and the Meerkat telescopes, <laughs> means that we can't go around um, just doing the same kind of analysis that we've done historically, because radio astronomers like to get their hands dirty, they like to get in with the data, they like to look at the data, and it is surprising how much work we actually do visually still today. Um, and so we need to automate an enormous amount of processing that involves a human component, still involves a human component today. Um, and of course, these days, if you want to automate things, especially if you want to mimic something that humans are doing, what we tend to do is design an artificial intelligence system that will replicate that, that process. Um, and within astronomy, the growth of artificial intelligence for this purpose, not just in radio astronomy, but in other branches of astronomy, has accelerated massively over the last decades. So this is just a, um, 
a plot of the number of papers on the archive in astronomy that have the keywords machine learning, deep learning, or artificial intelligence in their title or abstract. And you can see that it's just shooting up. Um, and obviously, this isn't specific just to astrophysics. Other branches of physics are also doing the same. Now, there will be some people who argue that artificial intelligence is the buzzword. We've been doing inference for ages, and isn't all of astronomy inference anyway? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how we do it is changing. Um, so, what I want to talk about specifically is how we can do artificial intelligence for image based radio astronomy in this talk. Um, and some of the main drivers for doing that are obviously population analyses. A lot of the science we do these days is not object by object, it's based on analyses of large populations of objects. And the SKA and its precursors will be doing large surveys that provide these populations of objects. So we need to be able to extract all of the populations of particular types of objects from surveys that contain hundreds of thousands, millions of these objects. Um, but moreover, and perhaps even more importantly, we need to know what are the things in those surveys that we haven't seen before that don't belong to these populations. What are the new things? Where is the discovery space? So when we automate these processes, we need to be very careful not to automate out this potential for discovery which in an AI sense is actually quite a complicated thing to do. Now, because I'm talking about images, mainly what I'm going to be describing today is based on a form of deep learning that uses convolutional neural networks. Now, I have assumed that most people will know what a convolutional neural network is at some level. Um, if something is unclear, please um, do shout. Um, and I'll try and explain it. So here's an example of a, an architecture for, an, uh, for a convolutional neural network. And what we might use this for is to look at an image like this. This is an image from the Meerkat telescope, which you can't really see, but as radio astronomers, you know, you know all the dots are radio systems. Um, and some of them are different to others. And in particular, at L-band, um, in the radio sky, you might see something that looks like this which has structure to it, and this is the Fanaroff Riley Type 2 radio galaxy. Um, and that's really what I'm going to focus on here, because I think this is a very nice machine learning problem, and it's something that we're going to have to do systematically with the SKA, and are already trying to do with the Meerkat telescope, which is to extract all of the radio galaxies from our survey data, and then label them as Fanaroff Riley Type 1 or Fanaroff Riley Type 2. So for those non-extragalactic um, radio astronomers, the difference between these two types of radio galaxies visually is that Fanaroff-Riley type 1 sources tend to have um, quite broad jets that sort of fizzle out into nothing, they look like smoke, essentially. You tend to see two jets, they are brighter towards the core, which is the supermassive black hole. Fanaroff-Riley class 2, tend to be much more highly collimated in their jets. They have bright hot spots from the shocks in their lobes, and because of relativistic boosting, you tend to only see one of the jets. So the other one tends to be uh, uh, not visible because of the boosting being in the wrong direction. So um, basic anatomy is supermassive black hole on spatial angular momentum, which gives you jets, which then impact on the surrounding medium, which gives you lobes or um, diffuse tails, if you like. Now, the, this morphological distinction is something that we've known about or known about or have had in the literature since the 1970s. It's not a new idea. And originally, in the 1970s, the, the most exciting thing about this was that all the Fanaroff Riley class 2 objects tended to be at high luminosities, and all the Fanaroff Riley class 1 tended to be at low luminosities. And therefore, there was a question of, you know, what is it about um, these particular objects that's causing that luminosity break associated with the morphology distinction? Is it intrinsic to the source? Is it something to do with the accretion mode or the jet dynamics? Is it environmental? Does it depend on whether they're in a dense or a rarefied medium? Is it something to do with composition of local material into the jets and the trainment of that material? Is it a combination of all these things? Um, and even though we've been talking about this in the literature since the 1970s, we still don't know. 
is the answer. And the picture is becoming more complicated because these days, this is data from the LOFAR telescope, we no longer see this clear luminosity distinction. So we don't just have FR2s up here and FR1s down here, we have this overlap region. And even more importantly, we have some blue dots down here with very low luminosity. So these low luminosity FR2 type sources are very difficult to explain how they come to be. Um, so understanding these radio galaxies is really key to understanding the evolution of galaxies beyond um, their, their host, if you like. Question. Um, yes? How um, sensitive is that survey is being just not a conservative or very extended for surface brightness chats and mega parsec plus scale radio? So how, how sensitive? It was not the existing surveys being, and how much did we improve? I mean, the yeah, so it's potentially, it's, you know, very large scale things. Yeah, so the megaparsec scale giant radio galaxies that the Rofar telescope discovered a whole bunch of them. Not only because of the surface brightness sensitivity, so it's a combination of, rel of um, resolution and noise core, but it's also because of the um, synchrotron losses. So in fact, these sources are intrinsically larger at lower frequencies because those losses are, are lower. Essentially, the, the, the relativistic electrons propagate further, so you see more larger sources at low frequencies. However, the size of the source and the morphology of the source are not the same thing. It's the, the key to this particular problem. The, the distinction here is morphological rather than based on angular size, although, as you can see, this is size here in the far I don't know if you can see on the bottom, there is a um, slant, but there is a selection bias going on there. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I think about a lot at the moment is how do we build a machine learning model, or an AI model, that will find these radiant galaxies. Um, and apologies for switching um, survey field just to illustrate the point, but this, so this is a low-far field with some more radiant galaxies. Um, zooming in here with an FR2 and an FR1 here. So if I wanted to build an AI model to look at all the radio galaxies in this field and tell me which ones are FR1s and FR2s, you might think, oh, that's easy. The FR2s are just edge brightened, you know, the FR1s brighter at core, it's quite straightforward. I can just eyeball these, look at it, and it's, you know, it's simple. You know, why is this a complicated problem? Um, and it's complicated for a number of reasons. Firstly, FR1s and FR2s are not discrete classifications, right? It's not that we have completely separate populations of radio galaxies. We've chosen these morphologies that lie on a continuum of underlying physical processes. We put in this subjective boundary, right? So that this is called classical fusion in AI. So they're not you know, perfectly separable objects. Also, even though we can pick out with our eyes that these are intrinsically different things, to a computer algorithm, they look really similar. So just to give you some other things that we know are very, very different, but computer algorithms find look very similar. Blueberry muffins and chihuahuas, very, very difficult. Standard benchmarking problem in AI. Uh, <laughs> Dachshunds and bagels, another one, very difficult. So the, this is the kind of optical illusion, if you like, it's not really an illusion, but the optical difficulty that our machine learning algorithm has to deal with in order to separate these sources. And then you throw in the fact that these are on a continuum, whereas we know that blueberry buttons and chihuahuas are definitely separable populations of objects. So it is actually quite a, a complicated machine learning problem, but it's extremely important because we're going to need to do this a lot. Just to show you how the numbers have been increasing over the years, um, here's a little zoo of radio galaxies. The MBSS survey in the 1990s, you get about 50 of these sources per square degree. From first, you get roughly 100. From low far, we get roughly 1,000. With the ASCAP telescope, we're getting a few thousand. If you go up to um, meerkat sensitivities or up to the SKA, we're going to be getting tens and hundreds of thousands per square degree. And it's really the resolution, the confusion noise is going to be the thing that saves us from these numbers. Um, now, if you took an expert radio astronomer, this number has been calculated by my PhD students by carrying around pictures of radio galaxies to people in our departments. It takes an expert radio astronomer about a, about a minute to be definite on a particular, 
particular radio galaxy, unless it's a canonical example. So that means that an expert radio astronomer could classify by eye about 125,000 sources per year if that was their full-time job, if they did nothing else. Sounds like fun. <laughs> um, you can turn to citizen science right, and ask the public for help with this. It's been done for lots of other projects. And there you can classify a much larger number, much faster. The downside is that if you have non-expert classification, you need a higher level of consensus in order to agree on a particular classification. So you need more people, basically. And whilst it is better than just using experts in terms of the numbers, it doesn't scale. Um, but if you have an AI algorithm that's trained to do this, then in principle, you can do 100 million sources in about 15 minutes. So it's a very attractive proposition. However, FR1, FR2 galaxies, like a lot of other astronomical classification problems, suffer from a number of um, AI challenges. Um, and so I've talked about FR1s and FR2s a little bit specifically, but more generally in astronomy, some of the issues we have are that we have large archival databases for which to train models and learn perhaps their models, but we only have small labeled data sets. So if we want to do supervised classification, I mean, we want it to tell us that it's a, a particular type of object, we don't really have large label data sets. This actually came as a surprise to me when I started doing this. I thought, well, FR1s, FR2s, there are millions of those. Everyone knows what these are. There are you know, first MBSS surveys have millions of sources. But you can only find catalogs of about a thousand labeled sources in a systematic way. Um, we have significant and variable class imbalances. There are not as many FR1s as FR2s in the sky. Uh, an, an AI model will be biased by class imbalances in its training data set will also be biased if you don't have the same balance between your training and your test data set, which is a, a generalization problem that I'll touch on later. Most machine learning and deep learning algorithms provide point-like <laughs> estimates. They do not give you uncertainties on their outputs. They do not tell you how confident they are. Um, for those of you who are familiar with softmax probability, that is softmax probability. It's not not um, a reliable metric. Um, and so we need methods for extracting cal carefully calibrated uncertainties in our models. We need to know how many false positives we're getting for a certain degree of confidence. And we need the biases in our models to be quantitatively estimated. And I think um, every astronomer knows how much work we put into understanding the selection biases that come from our instrumentation when we do surveys. If you then put an AI model on top of that instrumentation that introduces its own biases, you could undo all of that work that you've put in and just introduce a whole bunch of bias that you just don't know is there. Um, so all of these are, are generic challenges for AI. Um, I'm going to talk primarily today about the first one, how we deal with the fact that we have lots of data, but only small labeled data. Um, because this is, this is really something where the, the foundation model problem is, is probably the way forward, and, and that's what I want to talk about more generally. So what do you do if you don't have enough labeled data to train the machine learning model? Well, firstly, you could get more labels. Um, you could label more data using experts, but that is expensive, right? There are a finite number of astronomers. Um, as my postdoc, Mike, says, maybe enough grad students in the world, but there certainly isn't enough coffee. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that it's expensive to label scientific data is probably the reason you're in this situation in the first place. You can ask for help from citizen scientists, but as I already explained, you need higher consensus that also doesn't scale particularly well. Um, the second approach is that you can make better use of your unlabeled data. And there's quite a body of literature emerging in astronomy at the moment around generative machine learning using uh, variational autoencoders and uh, generative uh, adversarial networks. These work to an extent, they have stability issues, um, they do have biases, significant biases, and they also have substantial generalization or what are called synthetic gap problems which is just because you can simulate your data does not mean that any model trained on that simulated data will actually work on real data. That's the synthetic gap. Um, 
you can also use semi and supervised learning, self-supervised learning, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not saying that this is a perfect solution, it has its own issues, um, especially in, around generalization, the main data set shift, um, but I'll go into it in more detail. The third approach, which I won't talk about, but if anyone wants to talk about it afterwards, is um, that you can change the labels. If your labels are too expensive, change the way you label the data. Why do we have to call them Flannery Friday Class 1 and Flannery Friday Class 2, which no one really knows what it means and it's very subjective? Um, you can change your labeling so you can derive better semantic class targets that make your data easier to label. Um, so when it comes to self-supervised learning these days, mostly what most of the AI community is doing is building foundation models. So I assume everyone in the room has heard of chat GPT. Yeah? So GPT is a foundation model. It is a large language model that has been used for a wide variety of downstream tasks, um, which are either come from the latent representation or have been fine-tuned onto the model. So the way that a foundation model works is you take a large unlabeled data set, say the catalogue, the entire catalogue from the first survey or the MBSS survey or Gaia or whatever your, your choice of telescope is, and you train an unsupervised or self-supervised uh, deep learning model. Uh, Self-supervised models are models that are trained to um, provide structure in a compressed representation of your data, but they don't tell you anything specific about your data. You have to probe them to get that information out. So, for example, I could train my foundation model using the first survey, and that would give me that compressed representation. And then I could use that representation on a variety of downstream tasks. And I'll show you an example of this if it's not sounding particularly clear at the moment. But straightforward downstream tasks would be clustering with that latent space representation. So looking for particular um, <coughs> clusters of objects that are associated, not necessarily with our astronomical associations, but whatever the model thinks associates them. Uh, you can do a similarity search where you put some new object into that representation and you look for the closest. Um, archival objects or um, other things that are more like regression tasks, which I'll also talk about. Then, more usefully, perhaps, the other thing you can do is that once you've built your foundation model, you can fine tune it onto a specific problem with a much smaller labeled data set. So, training uh, a large deep learning model with a large data set is computationally very expensive. You don't want to do it. Right? Tra training GPT takes tens of petaflops of, of compute just to train the model. Um, and obviously not everyone can do that, right? You can't do it on your laptop, for example. Um, but what you can do is you can take a foundation model like GPT, download it, and then use a small amount of data to fine tune it for a problem. And that's computationally much cheaper. And then you can use that fine-tuned representation to do whatever that downstream task you want to do with your small label data set wants. And so you have the power of the foundation model plus the specificity of the fine-tuning, um, which generally gives you better performance than just using a small label data set in a fully supervised training mechanism. So for us, with our radio galaxies, we took um, the Radio Galaxy Zoo catalog, which is based on the first survey, which is a catalog of about 170,000 radio galaxies from the first survey. Now, it's a catalog in the sense that it tells you there's a radio galaxy there by associating the radio structure with the host galaxy. If you just take the first catalog, it gives you anything and everything, artifacts, point sources, star forming galaxies, many, many things. So this is the catalog specifically of radio galaxies, but it doesn't tell you what type of radio galaxy they are. And so we use that as our unlabeled, our large unlabeled data volume. So the Radio Galaxy Zoo allows us to train our foundation model, and then we use a much smaller catalog of labeled radio galaxies labeled as FR1 or FR2 to fine tune for that specific classification task, which is our, our downstream task. 
Um, the way we do this, for those who are more familiar with um, deep learning, is that we use um, a contrastive learning model called Bootstrap Your Own Latent, which is um, a joint estimation method. Um, so this is a really common way of doing a self-supervised foundation model. The way it works is it takes in individual training samples, so a radio galaxy, in its original form, and then in an augmented form. So augmented might mean rotated, flipped, noise level change, part of it occluded, um, the whole thing blurred. Um, and what it does is it learns representations from both the original image and the augmented image. So these are the models, these are the representations that get learned, and then the loss it calculates, it wants to minimize the distance between the original image and its augmented form in that latent space. So it's completely unsupervised in terms of <coughs> the, the particular problem you're addressing. It's based entirely on the structure within the data set that you train it on. Um, we do this using a momentum encoder for our augmentations, which is largely for stability. And then we back propagate through our main model here. Um, and it's that model that we then fine tune to do downstream inference tasks. Um, so, it's a QA popped up. Should I answer that now? Or if you wish. So, go ahead. Should I read it to you, maybe? Oh, I can see it. So, uh, obviously, you can't see it. So, the question is asking um, basically uh, how sensible is the FR1, FR2 classification? And should we remove this assumption and use ML to determine how many classes of radio galaxies there are? Um, and the answer is I suspect that's the way we're going. Um, so, I suspect we would use self-supervised model like this one to build a representation and then look for um, uh, continuums of structure within our galaxies and then associate those with other physical parameters. Um, so um, just some uh, points on the specifics here. So we use our own augmentations for this kind of learning. So typically, when you uh, use augmentation in, a machine, in an AI sense for deep learning, you use very standard things, rotations, flips, um, blurring, shifts, um, stuff like that. There is a growing body of literature which says that the augmentations you use um, affect your model's performance. Um, in a statistical sense. Um, so these have mainly come out of the Bayesian deep learning literature. Um, and the, uh, there is a school of thought that says that you should use what are called principled augmentations rather than unprincipled augmentations. So for astronomy, principled augmentations are corruptions of the data that might occur due to instrumental differences rather than random things that you could do to an image just because someone in computer vision does it to images. Um, not using principled augmentation is thought to possibly lead to something called likelihood misspecification in Bayesian deep learning, which is a, a different conversation. But um, we have been using our own set of augmentations, which are called astro augmentations, they're publicly available. They're not just for radio, they are clustered by um, wavelength, so if anyone's interested, please go and have a look. Um, and our model is also um, freely available on GitHub, including trained weights um, for this. And the papers are down here, it's slightly um, uh, obscured, but there's uh, two Mun uh, one MUNRAS, one RASTI, and one ICML paper down there. Okay. So. Firstly, the representation itself. So this is using the unlabeled large volume of data. And our full representation has 256 dimensions. So I have compressed it here using PCA and UMAP. Or in fact, Inigo Mulenin's paper has compressed it here. Um, 
So what you're seeing in the blue here is the full Radio Galaxy Zoo unlabeled data set. And here what I'm showing you is where the data points from the Mirabest, that small classified catalog, lie. Um, and the point that we're making here is that the RGZ data set is giving us a much broader representation of radio galaxies than just that small labeled data set itself. So it is bringing in new information. The other thing that was very interesting in this data set is that if you color code the RGZ data by source extent, that structure actually appears in the representation, even though the model knows nothing about that, way that we don't give those numbers to the model. Um, so this is the small sources are over here, the large sources are over here in the blue, and that structure has just emerged. The model has learnt the size structure in its representation. Um, so Sorry, this, when you say you don't give it the model, I don't understand what you mean there. So are you saying there's another parameter that's correlated with the size structure? No, so I'm saying, so for the RGZ catalogue, one of the columns in the catalogue is source extent in angular size. Um, but we don't give that number to our model. The model only gets the images. So it's structured our sources by size, even though we don't tell it the sizes. So the augmentation doesn't include shrinking and... It does. It doesn't, yeah. Okay. yeah. And by a factor, not by an infinite amount. And yes. it's only a factor of two years. So yeah. yeah. Um, but one of the reasons why this is quite interesting is because one of the downstream tasks you could do directly from the representation here is regression to source size. So that's an example of a, a downstream task that you can do with this representation. And um, the other thing we can do is we can look at the representation itself, and this is a, a streamlet app that Inigo has put together. So this is a different view of that same representation. Every dot is one of the galaxies from Radio Galaxy Zoo. And whilst the representation itself doesn't look like clusters in particular, you can see that there are over densities in certain regions. So you can actually investigate what the model thinks are more closely associated sources and go and find sort of the, the hundred sources in that area. And that's what the, the video is showing you. Now that kind of similarity search is even more interesting when you start then putting new sources through the model. So in this case, what we did is we took this source, which is a hybrid radio galaxy. So a hybrid radio galaxy means that one side looks like an FR1, one side looks like an FR2. It's not in our training data. So we took this image and we passed it through the trained model so that it, we found its location in the representation space. And then we looked at the uh, how many, however many um, closest neighbours there were using a cosine similarity search in that representation space to find if there were other hybrid galaxies. And in fact, all of these are hybrid galaxies. Um, so this is a really nice um, way of finding particular populations of objects based on a single example, just from that unsupervised representation. Um, very quickly, um, the fine-tuned foundation model um, shows statistically better performance for the supervised task of FR1 versus FR2 classification. Um, that's what this is showing. So the pink line is the fine-tuned model, which you can see is systematically lower in terms of test error than the fully supervised model. Um, and this is the number of labeled data points used for the fine tuning. On the right hand side, this is showing how the fine tuning um, depends on the number of layers being fine tuned in our model. Our model is built on a ResNet architecture and we fine tune with a, a particular decay back through the layers from the output layer. Um, and this is basically the number of layers backwards through the model. We found that including a decay, so the layers that are deeper into the model are fine-tuned more slowly than the layers at the end. It's very important for getting out good fine-tuned performance from the foundation model. Um, right, so I just wanted to wrap up by talking a little bit about what we're going to do next with this based on our previous work. Um, so at the moment, our foundation model is a traditional ResNet architecture, which just gives us out point-like estimates. So 
our next task is to turn this into a fully Bayesian uh, model, by which I mean that we will extract posterior uh, distributions rather than point-like estimates. We've looked at a number of different ways of training Bayesian um, deep learning models. We started, like everyone does, by using MC dropout, which is an ensembling technique, which is Bayesian approximation that assumes a certain posterior distribution. So it is, if you like, a specific case of variational inference. We also looked at a much more generalized variational inference model, which is often referred to in machine learning literature as Bayes by backdrop. Um, we have found issues with both of these in terms of calibrating our posterior uncertainties. And so what we're looking at now is actually Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, to train our models, which is computationally extremely expensive. Um, but what you can see from the three plots here, what I'm showing you are the softmax probabilities for 200 forward passes of the same sample through the same model, just using different Bayesian approximations. And you don't need to understand the details of the model. The key thing here is to note that the distributions of these points are different in all three cases, which tells you that however you make your model Bayesian, gives you a completely different posterior in these cases. And that's why we're going towards the Hamilton and Monte Carlo, <clears throat> because we need to know what the true posteriors look like. So these are some examples of the posteriors on a, a few of the weights in our models. And what we're finding is that regardless of how we specify the prior for our variational inference, the variational inference tends to converge on a local minimum. So it's not too far off, so it looks like it works reasonably well, um, but we can see from the, Monte Carlo, from the MCMC um, that the true posterior is actually quite structured and our global minimum is not at the same location as our VI um, minimum. And we think that this may be responsible for an effect we're seeing, um, which is known as the cold posterior effect in the, in the machine learning literature. Um, one of the places where understanding these posteriors is particularly important is identifying biases in your machine learning model. So to give you an example of a very, very simple bias that we see, this is um, a very simple deep learning model where we're feeding it a radio galaxy image at its original orientation, which I'm going to call zero degrees. And this is the softmax output for FR1 and FR2. So here you can see that um, it's clearly separated, it thinks it's an FR1 type galaxy. But if I rotate the orientation of that galaxy by a number of degrees here, the distribution of the softmax outputs becomes very, very confused. So the model thinks that the classification of the galaxy is different depending on its orientation which obviously is problematic because the orientation of radio galaxies with astronomical images is, is orientation unbiased, and so the outputs from our model should also be orientation unbiased. Um, so one of the ways that we have been um, fixing this is to use what are called group equivariant convolutional neural networks, where we encode equivariance to cyclic, i.e. rotational variations, and dihedral variations, so that's rotation and flips. Um, and the reason you need to do that explicitly is because convolutions themselves, by their nature, are not rotationally or reflection equivariant, they're just translationally equivariant. Um, and if we do that, um, just put both of these up at the same time, what we can see is that it changes the features that are going out of the convolutions and going into the classification. So for a radio galaxy rotating like this, in a normal convolutional neural network, convolutional layers would export these features, which you can see rotate with the galaxy. But if we then um, derotate them back to their original orientation, you can, still, so you can see that there's variance in those features as a function of angle. If we use um, a cyclically equivariant kernel, you can still see the rotation here, but then the stabilized view is essentially stable. There's some flickering, but that's due to numerical um, errors in the convolution. 
Um, and that basically fixes this problem for a large number of galaxies, not all. Um, so there's the original plot. And if we use the dihedrally equivariant kernels, we maintain the same classification at all orientations. Um, there's more work to be done here. Interestingly, we see that it has a larger effect on cyclic variations have a larger effect for FR1s than FR2s. For FR2s, you need the dihedral equivariants um, to reduce that, that bias. Um, but we think that that's a data bias in our, in our training phase. Um, and then very, very finally, we've also been um, creating machine learning models that learn the labels for galaxies, by which I don't mean that we're reclustering them, in representation space, but we're changing the way that we describe them. So rather than Fanner up Riley class one and Fanner up Riley class two, we're using what we call plain English words to basically um, define our scientific classes. We have to learn which words are most closely aligned with the scientific distinctions. Um, and this is some work that uh, my PhD student Michael Bowles has been doing. And this has also allowed us to pick out a number of very unusual um, radio galaxies based on those plain English words. So um, the things I've been presenting here today, I did not do just myself. This is my group. Um, so Mike has been doing the semantic work and working with Meerkat Telescope. Devon has been doing the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Fiona builds a lot of our data sets, including the Mirabeth data set. Inigo has been doing the radio foundation models. Um, Mike will be here in a month. He's moving from Manchester to University of Toronto on the Dunlap Fellowship. So a quick shout out to Mike's work. So Mike has been doing this with optical data for the Galaxy Zoo. So he has very nicely redrawn his representation space in terms of the galaxies that you see in different areas of that latent space. Um, and this is really nice visual representation of how you can see where different um, morphologies are clustered together. He was also the first person to show that um, domain-specific um, pre-training, so building a domain-specific foundation model, like astronomy foundation model, is actually more powerful than inheriting a computer science foundation model like ImageNet. Um, which took a lot, a lot of um, a lot of GPUs to do, um, but uh, provided some very nice results. So, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, I suggest you talk to Mike when he arrives. Um, and then, just to finish, I think this is very apt. And whilst I talk about all of these methods as the way forward, I would urge caution on everyone that they are very prone to misuse um, and sometimes you don't know you're misusing them until afterwards. Um, so um, yeah, as, as ever, XKCD says it better than, than you can. Um, and I'll finish there. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a number of things that we want to do. The first thing that, that we, actually, I should, I should have put a slide in, but um, so I showed earlier in the talk the distribution of luminosity and size from the LOPAR survey. So with our model, what we've actually done is we've now labeled the whole of the Radio Galaxy Zoo data set. So we have that, well, not for 170,000. So there are, there are about 3,000 objects in that LOPAR part. And um, we have, with, Photometric redshifts, we have 30,000. With spectroscopic, we have 17,000. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the low luminosity FR2s that are coming out of that classification because we now have quite a large population of low luminosity FR2s. Then the second thing we're doing is looking for um, strange objects in there, so odd radio galaxies. Um, third thing is looking at the structure of the representation space to see whether FR1, FR2 is really meaningful at all. Um, 
And then really what I'd like to do is move on to combined radio optical foundation models um, specifically for looking at early type galaxies. Um, and just to see what the um, self-supervised learning will teach us then. And then our biggest hope is that we don't do all of this ourselves, right? We're going to provide a model and hope that other people pick it up and do many, many exciting things with it. So are there not nearby sources in your sample that you can expect, say, for a automatic cosmic groups? That's a good question. And one I haven't thought about. Um, I don't know. That's the answer. Yeah. There's a strong theoretical prior to that. There are distant sources, argument sources of automatic cosmic groups. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's astrophysical um, uh, uh, line of sight issue, right? So, um, for doing that observation. Thing. I think maybe a related question, the quality of the chance of right to this, but do you, do you have estimates for like, how deep and how complete you would generate the catalog? So, not yet is the answer. So at the moment, what we're focusing on is <clears throat> the calibration of the uncertainties. Once we've got the calibration of the uncertainties, then we'll get our false positive rates, um, and then we'll look at completeness. Can, can you say something more about the uh, the fact it wasn't able to separate the classifications when you rotated the? Yeah. Just like I'm not. Yeah, like you did even, right? That should be trained on the rotation. <laughs> well, so it is. No, yeah. So yeah. So sorry. So I should. Yeah, I I did go quite quickly through this. Yeah. So um, we benchmark this. So when we so for each of these, but when we train them, let me see. When we train the model, we use rotational augmentation when we train the model, right? right. So yeah. there are lots of people will say. Well, you know, if we use, if we augment them with rotations, then we are approximating equivariance in our model. Yeah. The problem with that is that you're only, you're not enforcing it this time. So it's not, it, your model, your model hasn't learned equivariance, it's learned um, multiple copies of the same convolutional kernels at different orientations, but it hasn't enforced equivariance. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very dangerous. And the, the rotational augmentations are, are discrete. They're uh, discrete so values, did, it's not like a random. Yeah, we did one degree augmentations at 360 degrees. Oh, as in, yeah, yeah. So we did full rotation. Yeah, it's a question, sorry. So I should say at, at AI conferences, that is the first question I always get asked about this. And yes, yeah. If you, using rotational augmentation during training is not a replacement for enforcing equivariance in your convolution curves. Sort of interest. You basically actually do have to put physics in, which I'm very happy to give. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you could call this a physically informed deep learning model if you wanted to, but I mean, it's a, it's pretty basic stuff. Yeah, I but also it, yeah. really like the fact that you use normal English words so that poor students don't have to learn FR1 and FR2 anymore. <laughs> you know, Jarvan is just a pain of our lives. I, I think that's mainly my PhD student, Micah, presenting the fact that he had to learn my FR1. <laughs> <laughs> And never, never have another person suffering that. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, so you could, I mean, if you, if you wanted to go into it, right, the ethical issues associated with not only AI, but scientific literature around inclusion come back to language a lot. Um, so, and uh, I think, especially when you're working in the AI space, you have to be very careful of it because those issues are also amplified in the large language model space. And how we just, how we talk about things, even scientifically, really influences who participates in science. Earlier in the talk, when you were, were talking about things you wouldn't talk about with the GANs, you mentioned synthetic GAN. Yeah. Can you explain this? Is this just a function of the synthetic data being poor? Because you seem to gesture that it was something deeper. So it is something deeper. Um, so synthetic gap is a specific example of a generalization problem. What I mean by generalization is that if you tra train your model on one data set, it may not work on a different data set. And when I say different data set, that could be a survey with a slightly different detection threshold. 
same telescope slightly for the survey, um, uh, or it could be first to MBSS. Right? If you train on first, your model won't necessarily work on MBSS because even though you're looking at the same underlying galaxy, what you're measuring about it is different. Um, in the computer science literature, the example of generalization they always give is, an, is a photograph of an apple and a cartoon of an apple. Like as a human, we look at both of them and say they're both apples. But the model can't necessarily generalize from the photo of the cartoon. So generalizing from um, synthetic data to real data um, is a similar example. So it could be that your simulations aren't unrealistic enough in terms of uh, data corruptions. It could be that there are things in your data that you don't know about, and so you haven't simulated them, and that could be astrophysical things, or it could be corruption you don't know about. It could be that um, your data are too, your simulations are too perfect. So there is, a, um, there is a body of literature within computer science that um, claims that what's called domain randomization is actually helpful for improving generalization, which is basically a form of augmentation for unphysical augmentations that basically blur the lines of your representation and help your model not to collapse into specific modes. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, we, We've seen it not so much with the radio galaxies because we don't simulate radio galaxies. Uh, oh well, we, we, that's not true. We did simulate radio galaxies, but our simulations weren't good enough to even think about some better gap. Um, we see it with um, Faraday depth spectra. So, Faraday depth spectra, in principle, for Faraday thin objects are very simple things to simulate, right? It's, it's basically a cos and a sine, and then you add in your instrumental effects. Um, in practice, we see a massive synthetic gap between our simulations and our data. And there, I think it probably is that we're not simulating all of our data corruptions correctly, um, given the parameters of our instrument. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a specific example of that kind of generalization issue. It also gets called the reality gap. Sorry, but I, I don't mean to push this, but it okay. seems like it, it isn't the fundamental issue, it's just a matter of making the simulation better. Yeah, but if you could simulate your data perfectly, yes. what would be the point of observing it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a, it's a bit, yeah. Well, no, I understand this, this question about the varying depth and different features, but the last point you were making about the instrumental artifacts, I mean, this is something that... Yeah, so in principle, if I knew all of the instrumental artifacts, yeah, I could probably get rid of that one. But then I could say, well, you know, are all the sources we're observing really intrinsically Faraday thin? That what I heard seemed to be a, a, a dire warning about the applicability of simulation based tests. No, 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 no. So it's not a dire warning, it's just a. Uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a caution, I think, and since the people who do, the people who do this in enough depth know to call it simulation-based inference, um, are, are aware of conditions, right? Um, mainly I worry about this with the people who, you know, take a GAN from some computer science paper, run it on their own data and say, oh look, it's perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, which does happen, unfortunately. Maybe it's a good moment to thank our speaker again and then shift to the.